Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark. This is Neil. And uh, we're going to tell you about a typeface system that we've been working on for the past four years or so. And it's destined to go on for another year. So to start with, uh, this is the second largest continent on Earth. And it's home to about 1.2 billion people. And to state the obvious, as Eve just said, uh, there are a lot of languages in Africa, about 2,000 of them. And the large color bands that you're looking at here uh, show the geography of linguistic families, which have individual languages as their subsets. And of course, dialects are subsets of those. So here's what we wanted to do. We uh, wanted to design type for a part of the world where not much type is being designed. And we wanted to make a contribution to efforts to increase literacy, uh, to developing local economies and emerging markets, and also to the pro proliferation and restoration of written African cultures uh, pre-colonial era. And here's what we saw when we started. A, a complete absence of extensive families of African scripts and uh, poorly researched fonts in most Af of the African scripts. There were a couple of exceptions, single designs that stood out qualitatively. But most of what we saw were sterile fonts that were limited in scope with insufficient research that had led to incorrect glyphs and diacritic placement. And we also saw a chronic oversimplification of forms, which we'll take a closer look at a little bit later. Our answer to this was to research and design a very large type system of coordinated scripts that covers the most prominent writing systems in use on the African continent in different weights and, where appropriate, with italics. So clearly, we were not thinking on a small scale when we started this project. And so you see the scope of it here in this slide and the next. Uh, in light, regular, semi-bold, bold, and extra-bold weights, it has a Latin script with complements of the IPA, the International Phonetics Alphabet, and the African Reference Alphabet, which are used for hundreds of languages in Africa. Uh, it has Nko, uh, Gies, which is also called Ethiopic, uh, Vi, Tifinog, Osmania, and Adlam. We also have Greek and Cyrillic complements in the system. We named the family Kigelia after the Kigelia Africana, a tree that's indigenous to most of Africa. So as you can see, it's a pretty extensive system. And we're currently researching and developing an Arabic complement so that in the end, it will be truly a pan-African system. These are the primary areas of influence that these scripts have. And for a sense of scale, we always like to say this to our American audiences, uh, that green band uh, signifying the uh, area uh, influenced by the Adlam script, that's about as wide as the continental United States, coast to coast. So this is a type system that can handle multilingual tasks in print, but it's also designed with mobile devices in mind, especially since these are the motors of communications and commerce in Africa. Even in areas lacking a reliable power grid, and there are many, Mobile devices are everywhere, so that's why our weight strategy goes from a mono-weight light to a high-contrast bold. Now, this is still kind of uncommon in sans-serif types, but it's not without precedent. The advantage of this with respect to screen displays is that the stroke contrast in the bolder weights keeps the glyph counters open. And this is absolutely critical for some of the scripts in this system. The complexity of some of their glyphs would otherwise make bolder weights entirely impossible. And this way, we gain a lot of useful space inside the forms to work with. The fact that this technical strategy also conforms to many historical models made it seem like the best way to go. So very quickly, we'll take a look at, at the individual scripts. You, you know what the Latin script looks like, so we don't have to show you that. And uh, uh, this is a look at the Ge'ez. Uh, or Ethiopic, which is uh, one of the oldest writing systems we've worked on. Ge'ez is used for 12 languages in Ethiopia and Eritrea, making up a total language community of around 65 million speakers. This is the full complement of the Vi syllabary, the writing system of the Vi people in Liberia and Sierra Leone. The Vi language has around 119,500 speakers. This is a text set in the Tifinog complement. Tifinog is the writing system of the Berbers and nomadic Tuaregs of northern Africa and the Sahara region. 
the Amidzig language and its variants has, and, and, and its different variants have about 20 million speakers. This is a text set in the Osmania complement. Now, Osmania is a uh, Somali writing system which is not really in daily use anymore, uh, but it's valuable for recording and restoring to digital form manuscripts and various original artifacts that are important to preserving Somali culture and history. This is our Adlam, the writing system for Pular, the language of the Fulani people in West Africa. This is clearly the youngest uh, script that we've worked on. In fact, the inventors of this script are very much alive, and we worked closely with them over a period of months to make sure that our Adlam complement is accurate in its form and function. Around 50 million people speak Pular. Adlam reads right to left, has an upper and lower case, and it also has two variants, a connected, an unconnected and a connected form. And we'll look at the process of designing this a little bit more in, in more detail a little later. And this is our Nko. Uh, so I'm going to give you a closer look at our Nko to show you how this project the whole project generally developed because Nko was one of the first African scripts that we took on. And we were learning a lot in the process. Nko is a con uh, connected script, reads from right to left, and is an alphabet used for the Manding language in the dialects Bambara, Maninka, Mandinka, and Jula. Uh, Manding has around 40 million speakers. So uh, I'm going to use the journey of our designing Nko to show how our process developed during this project. So we started with extensive research. Okay, this may seem obvious at first, but what we're really talking about here is essentially learning as much about Africa as possible, its histories, its cultures, and its peoples, the whole environment. We cast our net really wide. We didn't just read scholarly books and papers on languages and orthographies, but also general history books, personal memoirs written by Africans, journalistic accounts of historical events, market reports in economics media, we knew it was really important to, to do more than just put some fonts out there, but rather to respectfully create something that the language communities are actually interested in using, something that they accept. So, of course, we go far beyond Wikipedia and Unicode proposals, and we dig far deeper than finding images online, wherever that was possible. When we were researching in Cole, we went to libraries and archives and sought out manuscripts and printed examples of the script. And compared to other scripts in the world, there's not a whole lot of information about it. But we did what we could to, to learn about the form and the function of the script and observed as much of it as we could and carefully, closely, uh, to, in order to understand its shape, to get a sense of where it comes from and why it looks the way it looks. So a little bit of history, the Nko script was invented by Suleiman Akante, a merchant and autodidact born in Guinea in 1922, uh, in order to provide a written form for Manding, which up until that time was primarily oral, although it was written occasionally using the Latin and Arabic scripts by religious and secular scholars. Kante finished his development of Nko in February of 1949. But when we first looked at Nko, we really didn't have a feeling for why it had the overall form character that it has. So we cast a wide net in our research, and we've just gotten used to doing that since then. Looking at regional cultural forms and patterns in everyday West Africa, such as what we're seeing in this cloth from Senegal, we could speculate at least that this environment had some influence on Kante's decision making when he was inventing the alphabet it would seem to make sense that the shapes of glyphs could have had their forbearance in something like what we see in these artifacts from Mali or in this village in Burkina Faso. One of Conte's motivations for creating Nko was the inability of the Latin and Arabic scripts to transcribe the complexity of Manding, and this is understandable since Manding is a tonal language. For example, each Manding vowel can take on one of 16 variations in length and tone. You're only looking at five of them here. But you can clearly see the problem with the Latin transcription on the left. And yes, Latin diacritics have been used in the past to indicate tone, but we found studies that show them to be fairly ineffective at that. So while we're doing our research, we're developing a first draft of the complement. And we're 
making the best interpretation of that research that we can, adding to it the stipulations imposed on the form by contemporary media. So here's a point in the, this is a good place in the presentation to sort of step back a little bit and look at that topic of oversimplification that I mentioned earlier. Of the few and co-fonts that were already out there, they all looked like this. This is just an example. This is Noto, uh, which is a kind of graphical simplification of the script. And we found that this happens a lot when scripts are first digitized and made into a font. It's a bit like turning every African script into Futura. And then, unfortunately, this approach is often perpetuated by those who follow. But in handwriting, Nko looks like this. This is, in fact, Suleiman Akante's handwriting, which we found far more energetic and warmer and more personable. And in designing our Nko, we wanted to restore some of those nuances of the original script and bring that energy back into it to give it a sense of the humanity that its readers might associate with. So after the first draft is completed, that's when we begin to establish contacts to experts and members of the language community. Now, to many of you, this may seem counterintuitive, but this is not a normal situation where it is smart to contact and survey a target audience before beginning to design something. We found it was wise to have something in hand at first contact because the people we're contacting don't know who we are. They only know that we're not from their culture. So it shows them that we've already learned quite a bit about their script and culture and that we're serious and that we know what we're doing when it comes to designing type. Plus, it gives us something to immediately engage them with, to talk about and to get feedback on. And we also found it to be respectful of their time because as we found out, most Africans we contacted were not interested in receiving monetary compensation for their guidance. So we found this was the most respectful and, and economic use of their time. But in the beginning, we were still developing our process. And once we had a first draft, we really didn't know how to establish a connection to someone to talk to in a language community an entire ocean away. And when we did eventually find someone, an interesting thing occurred. A rapid succession of connections followed, where one person led us to the next person, who led us to the next, and so on and so forth. It looked a little bit like this. And in the end, we had this team of critics, and in the course of the project, we came to slowly realize that these people are actually at the core of the Nko literacy movement in West Africa. These were the guys driving the whole thing. And now, establishing contacts didn't work this way with every script we worked on, but things like this happened regularly in the course of the project. It was only the beginning of our understanding of how large the African diaspora is and how tightly they connected they are to their homelands. Their feedback was enthusiastic, definitive, and thorough, which we were really happy about. And we were able to make our design correct, readable, and functional. When we submitted an italic to them, which had never existed before as a typeface, they welcomed it. So in the end, what we had was the first multi-weight, multi-style, and co-typeface family. OK, so I'm going to use this, this highly technical, super complex infographic here. I, I need you to focus on this. Uh, I, but I'm going to use it to, to emphasize an important point about all this that, that influenced our work a lot. This illustrates something we learned from an educational linguist we've gotten to know who does his field research in West Africa and specializes in Manding. And as I mentioned before, Manding is often written using the Latin script. But he told us that interest in literacy that is, having an interest in learning how to read and write within the Manding community throughout West Africa increased dramatically with the introduction of the Nko script. And the reason is, be is, is because they understand that Nko is theirs. They own it. It's a symbol of who they are. It's a kind of cultural icon. And this is a phenomenon that we became aware of in just about all of the African scripts that we worked on, even the Latin IPA to a certain extent. It's a consideration that didn't come naturally to us, because after all, how many Western Europeans and Americans experience ethnic pride in the Latin script? And I believe the answer is, we don't. We're more inclined to take some pride in our native language, depending on culture, but not the writing system that transports it. 
But we came to understand that in Africa, as in many places on Earth, writing systems are more than just writing systems. They're also symbols of cultural identity. And that puts pressure on us. That demands respect from the type designer. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about Adlam. Uh, so unlike Nko, uh, developing the Adlam complement it really allowed us to, it allowed us to work with it directly with its inventors, uh, Abdullah and Ibrahim Abari. And the Barry brothers invented their writing system in the 80s as teenagers. And they've been actively improving it, promoting literacy, and, and creating educational content for the Fulani ever since. Uh, much like other scripts like we have worked on, we, uh, we exchanged proofs over the course of a few months. Uh, we discussed those changes over phone and email. Um, and you can see the level of feedback. You know, this de it's a lot of detail and feedback, real subtle stuff. And this is kind of a unique experience of uh, working directly with a script inventor. Uh, you get really into these nuances of letter forms. Now, during this process, uh, we found ourselves modifying glyphs, sometimes quite dramatically from the initial drawings we received, and then reverting them completely back to ones, the versions we've had before. And this is kind of really sort of initially confusing to us. Um, but fortunately, uh, we were able to meet up in person, uh, and we worked through each glyph one by one and finalized you know, our design. Uh, and this really was kind of important. Uh, this session was really important in that uh, it really gave us a time to kind of understand their sensibilities and elegance in letter form, which are kind of d different from ours. Um, but it also had, we had this you know, great time to talk and chat about why these changes were being made, and then we discussed things about the, you know, the language community as a whole, and uh, you know, so it was a little more you know, well-rounded conversations. Um, now here's a look at some of the changes. So our, our typeface, Kigeli, is on top. Uh, below is, uh, is Noto Adlam. This is uh, kind of the default web experience you have now for Adlam. Uh, and it's built heavily on the Unicode model that was uh, kind of a few years old by now. Uh, that's what it was designed against. Uh, so here's some of these changes. Some of these changes are fairly simple, uh, kind of basic structural changes, the way things connect. Uh, is another example of that uh, here. Uh, while other changes were, were far more dramatic, total kind of redesigns of letter forms. Uh, here's a few lowercase letters uh, that do the same. Uh, we also had uh, things that when we were working on it together, we just kind of said, oh yeah, this is going to be diff problematic for uh, uh, when we increase the weight on things. So we kind of made some adjustments for that. Uh, and so you can see that some of those adjustments there. Uh, there was also uh, things that we kind of found that were problematic uh, as the script and diacritics were connecting. Uh, so we have some positionally sensitive alter, uh, alternate forms where the senders get shorter in medial positions. So we kind of <coughs> sorted all this out. But, to really understand you know, why we, we were struggling to, to kind of arrive to this final design, uh, uh, we kind of have to step back and look at the last step of our process. Um, and when we started working with Co and Adlam, you know, we quickly recognized that the, the newness of these scripts, it really limited our ability to fully understand how these scripts were used. Now sure, there were like uh, a variety of existing printed documents, but those documents didn't really represent the modern usage of these scripts. And we thought the best way to understand this it was to provide the people with a way to actually use their own writing system. And that was by making cell phone apps. Uh, this also allowed us to you know, have a way to contribute something back to those language communities uh, that invested so much time and energy helping us out. Now, as type designers you know, entering the world of app development, you know, we kind of went through approach, like a very simple approach. This is what it was. Uh, the, the premise was that the primary barrier to a language community and their ability to communicate online it was essentially just the lack of an interface to the computing device in, an, in their native script. And probably all of you are familiar with this in this room, but the three basic elements here, are you need the fonts, uh, Unicode and shaping, and then of course an input method, a keyboard or something that you can actually type in with. Uh, and the result of our endeavor in this, in this whole app development realm is this suite of keyboard and calculator apps. You know, our goals are always uh, target to target communication, commerce, and education. And on the one hand, they're like basic tools, right, to uh, most of us. But they're really the necessary foundations for interacting, you know, with a mobile device and ultimately on the internet. Now, these layouts were all optimized uh, with the help from the language communities, you know, always trying to ensure that the layout and functionality made sense to them and served their primary needs. Um, and, it, you know, as, as more people downloaded, we would get feedback and we'd kind of incorporate that feedback into the apps and, and add features as necessary. Um, and as Mark pointed out earlier about uh, 
you know, the desire for literacy uh, increasing with the ability to do so in one's own script, the same really applies to mathematics. Uh, and so for educational purposes, we have a couple of simple calculators. Uh, what I'm highlighting here is our kind of more sophisticated one. This one's more commerce oriented. Uh, it has the ability to seamlessly switch between multiple scripts. You can see those scripts here. Um, and it's something that really can be a, a useful aid uh, when transacting in a marketplace where uh, it's very common for, for members from different ethnic groups to, to interact. Um, and uh, along the lines of commerce, it actually has an integrated uh, means for doing current, uh, unit, uh, currency and unit conversion. So, you know, we found all of our apps. They were actually very well received by the respective, lang respective language communities. And the nice thing was we were able to actually see how our, our you know, typeface performed on mobile devices, right? And then we could take th that kind of information and, and make those technical adjustments as necessary. So you can kind of say, on one hand, we sort of really achieved our goals, right? But this whole exercise of generating the apps, it really, ex you know, it taught us something a lot bigger. Uh, and it really showed us that this whole thing with the input methods, this is really only just a small part uh, to the big picture, you know? It's like, of, you know, to getting to wider internet adoption and script adoption. And so if we were to kind of step away from this model, kind of zoom out, you can see the space, and what fits into here is that there's all these other factors. There's uh, factors like economics and infrastructure, society and government. They all play a role in successful internet adoption. And I'm going to quickly highlight a few of these in the broader ecosystem, these factors, just to give you a sense of things that we take for granted uh, because of our experience with mobile commuting, co computing. Uh, smartphones, they're not nearly as ubiquitous in Africa as they are in other continents, uh, and there's tremendous growth in this sector, uh, but there's still quite a ways to go. And if you look at what the, the infrastructure of this mobile computing environment or internet coverage and that sort of thing, it's actually, it's not quite as robust as, as we expect. Uh, you know, while the coverage is quite good, most of it is operating at 2G speeds, uh, and the data is actually quite expensive. Um, and as Mark mentioned, reliable electricity is not widely available. And then there's things like uh, the lack of credit card-based payment systems. What this does is sort of dis disincentivizes future app developers from localizing their apps in these languages. And to make it worse, uh, the lack of high-paying uh, ad networks, competitive high-paying ad networks, does the same. So why does all this matter? The reason is uh, growth in literacy in Odlum and Co. Is, has been catalyzed by access to the internet. Uh, and since neither script is really taught in state-run schools, that activity is being conducted in grassroots efforts on the ground, but increasingly so on social media platforms like Facebook, WhatsApp, and Telegram. And as a result, these platforms host a fair amount of the meaningful content in both of these writing systems. Uh, and they also serve as a way to connect the diaspora to the folks in the country, as well as to the larger Manding and uh, Fulani communities across Africa. So you can imagine how you know, developments in this ecosystem, or lack of, really can uh, really control how the more isolated communities uh, and when, uh, they be, how and when they actually become incorporated into the larger whole. So this is, this is really important. So I want to kind of illustrate this in a different way. So what we're looking at here is this kind of chronological map to internet adoption for English speakers in the United States. And you can see this, you know, these very isolated circles on the left, right? What these are, this is really all constitute the foundations of our language and infrastructure. Uh, and then this really busy part on the right, that's, uh, those are all the developments that were, uh, you know, that came into play that brought our communities online. So in essence, we can say for us, uh, the internet is just this layer that's built upon this well-established foundation. But what's this map look like for the Manding and Fulani? Uh, it looks like this, right? So you can see that all those fundamental things like literacy and script development and education are all evolving simultaneously alongside the technological infra infrastructure developments in a much compressed time frame, effectively all exerting influence on one another. Uh, and it was in fact just a few weeks ago over coffee with uh, Abdullah and Ibrahima that Abdullah explained to us that the Fulani themselves didn't even had not become fully aware of how widespread their own ethnic group was within Africa uh, until they started using Facebook. So that really kind of opened things up for them. Uh, and it's actually, there's a, another thing we had learned too in that conversation was that uh, upon realizing the prevalence of Pular in the region, uh, you know, there's Kanurian Hausa speakers that are actually starting to consider maybe using Adlam as a way to transcribe their own languages. So there's, there's a lot of things happening. So if we step back, right, go back to their original problem, like when, 
you know, what, what, why, why are we making all these changes when we're working on Adlon? Uh, and we could see that it was really in response to this dynamic, all these things happening at once. Uh, over the span of a few years from the initial Unicode proposal uh, to the time we started working with the berries, a lower case was added to the script. Uh, decisions about whether a connected or unconnected variant was the default uh, changed as it became clear that people preferred to learn, uh, they, uh, learn the reading of the writing system on the unconnected script, but once they became experienced, they preferred to use the connected script. Uh, there were these structural changes that we made to accommodate weight and design. But what all these ad adaptations are, they're adaptations that enhance the ability for the writing system to express more complex ideas. Uh, and, and all these changes essentially add semantic layers of semantic value to the writing system. You know, and at the same time, what was going on is this very active, online, engaged community is providing feedback in real time about the letter forms that they find confusing, problematic, or unpleasant. And our keyboard app uh, effectively provided an unofficial beta test of our typeface, as well as a means to really exercise it. Uh, and all this feedback was being brought back as design changes. So, of course, this makes sense, right? We'd expect as a writing system grows, uh, as the user base of a writing system grows, uh, and the demands on its ability to express ideas expands, we would, we'd kind of expect those things to evolve. The difference here is, is the pace of this feedback. And what this experience has illustrated to us is that the extensiveness of our research and our process was mo did more than just to satisfy you know, our desire to learn as much as possible. But it turns out it's absolutely necessary in creating type that's of interest to its users and up to date with the latest practices. And this is particularly important in the early stages of a writing system when it first gets encoded into Unicode. You know, and an unfortunate reality of this is that during this period, Unicode doesn't move as fast as things do on, ground, on the ground. Uh, so when things are discovered, like the need for new punctuation or additional characters for scientific notation, it could take up to a year or more for those things to become official. And this can be frustrating for the language communities who are trying to ensure that people are learning, you know, to, to, uh, learning to use their writing system in the proper way, but also when they're trying to create more sophisticated, complex content and finding they're missing the characters to do so. And furthermore, the forms presented in Unicode, um, in those code charts, you know, they become quickly obsolete. Uh, and at a more basic level, you know, Mark talked about this, but you know, I kind of reiterate because it's important, is they're often way too uh, simplified to be good models, uh, and which leads to the proliferation of problematic fonts. And we can see here in the case of Vi, there's these uh, you know, very simplified geometric versions of these Vi characters, and, and they lose their sort of connecting DNA. Uh, and that's something that you don't see in the manuscript and that we try to rectify. So really, we need to always be uh, aware that these Unicode models, they really need to be considered as placeholders, not as you know, canonical uh, references to, to designing the typeface. So this brings us to a few concluding words about research. Um, at the beginning of the year, someone tweeted, you, you may remember this, I can't remember who it was, uh, but they said in a tweet, and I paraphrase, uh, can we all agree on the fact that reading a Unicode proposal is wholly insufficient research for designing a non-Latin typeface? Do you remember that? Uh, and we couldn't agree more. When it comes to African scripts, the thing you have to understand is that the glyphs in the Unicode charts have their origins from linguists doing field research, mostly in the mid-20th century, and before personal computers. So when recording the glyphs of writing systems that they were researching, they literally made stick drawings to describe the forms that they were seeing, with virtually no consideration of the visual properties of those forms beyond their basic structure. The richness and the nuances, often even the ductus of these scripts, are not there. Fast forward to the 1990s and the 21st century, and these caricatures are perpetuated in digital fonts because the people responsible are not digging deep enough in their research. Add to that the dynamic scenario of the rapidly changing landscape that Neil just described, and you can imagine how far off a poorly researched result can be. These then become the one or two fonts that, these, that some of these language communities have to work with and in our communications with them, they've made it clear to us that they don't care for them, they don't function properly, they're sometimes hard to read, and they're really not interested in using them. On the other hand, people have expressed enthusiasm about what we're doing, and they're looking forward to using Kegelia. This image shows a, a conversation we had just last week from, uh, that came just out of the blue to us from someone who teaches in co in Guinea. 
and, uh, and he expressed his uh, thanks for the, the work that we're, that we're doing. He also sent us a picture of the over 400 students that he teaches in KOTU, uh, which we thought was really great. So that being said, we're able to announce for the first time here uh, that we have our first licensee for Kigalia, and that is Microsoft. And we're really happy about that because they have a good presence in Africa in the desktop sector, so in government offices, uh, businesses, academic institutions, publishers, uh, even of school books, and bloggers, etc. And we're working with them to ensure that each script works as it should in their products. We'll be seeing if we can get other businesses on board because we still need to get Kigalia on mobile devices and cloud-based word processing apps. And in doing so, making it available to everyday people in the cities and the towns and the villages. So thank you for listening. Uh, we hope you liked it. That first URL up at the top there is a microsite. Uh, the rest is all our studio underneath. But uh, that's a, a microsite that has more about the, the, the family on it if you want to see more yeah. and proofs and specimens and that kind of things. And uh, a lot of people we work with are sort of credited there so you can see all that. Yes, as well. credits and acknowledgments are also there. Yeah. So thanks a lot for your time. Thanks. Great.